Hey everyone, welcome back to another Chemphizone special episode. This time we are creating high poly geometry by using smoothing groups in combination with a chamfer and the turbo smooth modifier. Let's take a look. So before I get into the details of it, I just want to explain to those people that are new to it, what all that means. What is a high poly model? What is a low poly model? Those things are essential for baking out a so-called normal map that we will then apply to our low poly in the game. And in order to make it obvious, I'm gonna switch over here to the wireframe view. And that will pretty much already explain what our high poly model is here. This one here, the tessellated mesh, has half a million polys. In contrast then here to our low poly model that you actually see in the game, which doesn't even have 2000 polys. So that might still be considered pretty high, but keep in mind that this is what you have right in front of the camera. Because obviously we don't want to put a mesh in that has half a million polys. That would make your game basically unplayable, especially if you treat every object like that. So this is the reason why we need to have some way to add extra details onto our low poly model. If you look at this here, it's very, very sharp, everything, all these edges here in contrast to our high poly model. So this is how you would actually want to have it. But since we can't put that mesh here into the game, we have to find another solution. And that's called a normal map. The normal map is the result of our high poly bake down onto our unwrapped low poly. And we then apply it as a material to our low poly in-game model. So this is actually what the player would see because it has this texture applied to it. And you can see that we have this nice little smooth beveling and this shading and all these details here. We even have that, that floater text here. And I'm going to talk about floaters in just a moment. But just to sum it up, this here is basically what we want to achieve. And those two models here are what get us there. Okay, so much for the introduction. Let's take a look at the actual teaching material here in that tutorial. And that is the workflow to achieve such a high poly model. If you are familiar with my tutorials, then you know that I like to first approach the low poly model because that just makes sense. You wanna have your geometry as simple as possible at the beginning and then work your way up towards the high poly model with all these details. Like you don't wanna start the other way around. I mean, a lot of people choose to and that's perfectly fine. But in my opinion, the best way to approach the whole hard surface modeling is to first take a step here at the low poly model. And then at some point where let's say we achieved something like that here, I would then just take it and copy it basically make a clone version out of our low poly that we have here, because this is really all the details that you would ever need in the game. It has all the functionality here. If you would ever need to move such a piece here, you can do it. So this is really what matters to have all these elements in place. And then it's time to think about our high poly model. Well, obviously, while you work on it, you should already think about it. So as you get better at the modeling, you know what matters to achieve a nice high poly. But long story short, at some point when you have your model in a stage where you're happy with it, you would then just copy it and put that copied stuff into a new folder, which you can then call high poly model. And from there on, it's a matter of applying the modifiers to it in order to get the high poly model out of it. So we still have our low poly model in place, but we are now able to use that geometry to build our high poly. And one thing that's important to mention, just really so that there's no confusion, like this here is just a demonstration purpose that I put them apart, like high poly, low poly, and low poly with a normal map. But if you would clone that, 
then obviously it would be in the same place. And that is exactly where you'd also want it to be. Because later when we bake our normal map, the normal map will require your high poly stuff to be in the same place as your low poly where you bake it upon. Anyway, so much for that. Let's take a look at what actually gets us to have this kind of a high poly based on our low poly geometry. So in order to demonstrate that in the best way, I'm just gonna assume that this here is the low poly that we just copied in order for it to become the high poly now. And let's just take one of these elements here. I'm gonna rid it of all its smoothing groups. And that is a crucial part of that whole workflow, which consists out of smoothing groups in combination with a chamfer modifier on top of it, plus then the turbo smooth that's going to tessellate it. That will then give us our high poly. So you will always start basically here with your core polygons that now, as you can see, don't have any smoothing group applied. I just deleted them all. And that's just so that you really get to see how it behaves. I'm gonna apply the chamfer modifier onto it. I'm going to put from smoothing to unsmoothed edges. I'm gonna put the amount all the way down. And now you can see that it actually puts all these support loops that in the past people would just place by hand by like cutting it all in manually, which is super time consuming. You can see now that it actually enables us here with that modifier to really automate that process like entirely. And it's based on our smoothing groups. So every polygon here right now is getting that chamfer treatment which then if we would put the turbo smooth on top, gives us our high poly model. So that here is basically what you could already bake out. But then the problem is that it would also look like that in your normal map. And obviously that looks really strange. So that means that we need to go back here to our editable poly and take a look at our smoothing groups. The smoothing groups are a group of polygons in our mesh here, which form a smooth surface. So right now, every polygon has its own smoothing group, pretty much. Well, we deleted it all. So that would be here the equivalent of having one smoothing group for each polygon. Right now, it doesn't have any, which is the same thing. But if we would take that thing here and give it one smoothing group, then you can see that it lives up to its name. It smoothed that whole surface here. It described that shape here where some polygons are connected and where others are not. So in order for this whole thing here to smooth nicely, like it does here, now that we reapply our modifiers, we have to make sure that everything has its smoothing groups where it's supposed to have it. So I'm gonna put one here. I'm always putting auto smooth, by the way. Usually I just like to work with this auto smooth because it's easy. It looks at our angle. So I'm gonna put auto smooth here. Then I'm going to make a selection here for this group. Let me also take these ones here. And I'm also going to auto smooth it. So now you can see this is perfectly smooth. And let's just take another look here with our modifiers applied on it. If we only look at the chamfer, then we see that wherever we applied these smoothing groups here, we have this nice support loops around the chamfer regions. So that is exactly what we are doing here with that method that we tell 3 Max, like, look, here's our smoothing group, please chamfer around it. Give us these support edges that we need in order to work with the Tubu Smooth. So here with Tubu Smooth, you can tell that this here looks nice. This here, however, still needs more smoothing groups. So sometimes I also just like to go into like front orthographic perspective and just tell it to auto smooth that whole bunch here, this whole set of polys, which then 
pretty much solves the whole issue. Like it's really just one button click. And sometimes then you just, you still see a few things that you have to zoom into that need some additional tweaking. So in that case, I'm just gonna make sure that this year I want it to be one smoothing group for that whole cutout shape here. So I'm going to increase the angle, tell it to auto smooth. And now you can see it's exactly how we would want it to be. So that would be something that we could now pretty much consider a finished high poly piece that we can bake down to our low poly. And one thing that is also very nice about this modifier is that very often people bake stuff out a little bit too hard etched. So if you look at it so zoomed in and you have your reference image on the other side of the screen, it's often tempting to just go as the real life version. But for game creation, like game art creation, you really want to make sure that your edges are actually a bit rounder than they might be in the real life. So that means that you can control here the amount and make it a bit, you know, more beveled than you may actually think it should be. So something like that here would just ensure that even if you're a little bit further away, we still have this nice normal map look on it instead of having, well, pretty much that here. So you want to make sure that your normal map really has a few pixels of information around these edges. And because of that, it often makes sense to just go a little bit softer than you actually would think it should be the case. So that's just a side note. The other thing that I want to also talk about is that you may have already spotted it if you paid attention that we have a few strange little pinching things going on here. And that's because we have some N-Gons here, which by the way is uh, another video that you may want to watch, the N-Gon special. That's okay to have on the low poly geometry. However, here in combination with that chamfer modifier, we get issues like that here. Wherever we form a triangle here like that, it does a really odd job. And then in combination with the turbo smooth, which smooths in a pretty poor way, as you can see here. So unless we go back to our actual wireframe and get rid of these triangle intersections by reconnecting or getting rid of some edges, there's nothing we can do about it unless you are willing to buy a third party modifier that you can get from Mario Silagi. It's called Quad Chamfer and it just does a better job than the default chamfer modifier. And I'm just gonna show you what it does in contrast here to the stock version chamfer modifier. So let's disable the chamfer modifier, which by the way, gives you an idea of what it would look like here without these support edges and I'm just going to apply the quad chamfer. So this is the name of that third party modifier, which is superior to the chamfer. It's really fantastic. And it's solely because it does one thing that the chamfer modifier doesn't, which is that it takes care of these pinching issues that we have going on here. So you can still see like there's some odd stuff happening. However, now we're going to enable quad intersections on it, which then perfectly collapses that stuff and leaves us with nothing but smooth geometry all around. So this is basically the same kind of a modifier. It lets us do the same stuff. Like we can still bevel our edges, but you will never encounter ever any pinching stuff. So I'm just going to toggle it here. So this is the chamfer modifier and this is the quad chamfer. So it might be a very minor thing really that you may not find worth to upgrade to this modifier. It's like I said, a third party modifier, 
But if you really want to have the best quality result, then I really recommend you to get that modifier. It's worth every cent. And in the end of it, in my tutorials, I'm still going to use the stock version here because I don't want to make people buy something that otherwise they couldn't follow the tutorial. However, it's just something to keep in mind. If you want to have the best quality, sometimes it's just necessary. So also here, like I have some pinching going on here. Let's swap it and you can see it's gone. So you can just see this will generate a perfect normal map. And at the end of the day, this is really what matters. So once again, normal map, that is really what we're going to see, what we're going to look at the whole time. And because of that, it's just crucial to make sure that we have the perfect smooth geometry. And I almost forgot to mention the so-called floater text that I was speaking about at the beginning. What is a floater? For those people that don't know it, it's like the name suggests geometry that is hovering or let's just say floating in front of your actual geometry where you want to bake it down upon. So in that case here, we know that we want to have these details here added to that cylinder. And in order for us not having to actually boolean all that stuff in there, like actually physically cut it in, we can get away by adding these details here as floaters. And later on, when we bake our normal map, it's being recognized as a detail that will just get baked down onto our texture. So you can see here, we have all these details here on our actual low poly that is just floater geometry. So that makes it super easy and you will love the floaters if you work with 3D stuff on a daily basis because it allows you to add a whole bunch of flexible, good looking detail without actually having to put a ton of work in. So you could just place that wherever you want and it would then bake this kind of a thing here down on our model or texture, I should say. And just at the end of the tutorial, I want to show a few more tricks here. Actually, one more trick, like let's say you have this detail here and you find it a bit dull and boring looking. Let me just show you how fast you can add detail here with that method. So for instance, we could just inset that here, pull that out a bit. Keep in mind that is our high poly model. I was just giving that here a smooth. And now you can see like we have this extra detail here, which now then again with the floaters would be like a bit of an overlap. So we could just scale them down a bit more. So there's always a hundred different ways that you could add more details, like super fast, like just by insetting and uh, like pulling that stuff in here. Let's give that another auto smooth. And then sometimes you would see these little artifacts here. That's because we don't have another support ring here. However, we can just once again, like add that here on a flat surface, grow that selection, give it one smoothing group. And now it's gone. Like this is the perfect geometry. Obviously that wouldn't work here with that thing in the way, but just to give you the idea how flexible we can be here with that method. And another example would be to cut in some extra paneling stuff like for example let's take these edges here i would then just make that edge selection and i would extrude it on a very small margin here like you can see there's actually this extruding going on so now it's it's looking like that so i would then select again these polygons give it an auto smooth and then we have something like that, like some extra detail here, which we could also add wherever we want it. Like, let's say we do the same thing here. 
just smooth it. And now we have something like that. So you can see that adds a ton of details really fast and just makes it for a really nice way of working. If you would want to have that here perfectly smooth, you could then just chamfer it, something like that. Also give it an auto smooth. And now we have this here actually as a beveled curve. So sometimes it's a compromise of like having like stuff really as a sharp edge or smooth. But at the end of it, like it just makes it very flexible. You can, of course, always use other methods like open subdiv. But for me, this here is the method that just works very well. I, I prefer it because probably mostly due to being used to it so much. And uh, I just find it very flexible. So thank you very much for watching that special episode of creating high poly geometry. Next time, we're going to take a look at creating the ideal unwrap here for our low poly model. What needs to be considered, where to place these uh, UV shells. And then we are going to bake that stuff down. So you're going to learn about unwrapping and baking, which goes hand in hand with what we were just doing here with the high poly modeling. So everything is a chain that needs to be pretty much followed step by step and you can't just start slacking on one part. So it's good opportunity to have this special episode uh, series here to really cover the workflow that I use in the tutorials if you followed them in the past. So I hope you liked it. I'm going to see you soon and please feel free to follow on the Chamfrey Zone Facebook page as well as signing up to that forum here, which has a really nice uh, community going already. So once again, thanks for watching. I'll be seeing you soon. More tutorials are already on the way. Until then, and happy modeling. Cheers.